if you survived your own death, only to have death hunt you down and kill you and your friends one by one, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat death in Final Destination 5. This group of people is about to die a brutal death. Sam here is attending a company retreat with his co-workers and his ex-girlfriend Molly when their bus is stopped by construction workers doing repair work. Sam thinks this is a normal stop with no idea that the bridge is about to collapse and he's going to be killed in a freak accident. Sam feels an eerie gust of wind run through him as the bus stops. He accidentally gets cut by a metal shard on the sheet and the bus's radio malfunctions. He knows something isn't right and Sam asks his best friend Peter if he felt the bridge shake but he didn't. Freaked out, the man looks outside the front window to see that the bridge is starting to collapse. Terrified, the man grabs his ex-girlfriend's hand and runs out of the bus, but they're trapped as the bridge falls all around them. One of Sam's co-workers, Candace, falls from the bridge to her death on top of a ship's mast. Scared out of his mind, the man runs towards safety with his ex-girlfriend and his best friend as their bus falls to the water, killing Isaac, another one of their co-workers. Sam, Molly, and Peter run towards safety, but they must dodge crowds, parked cars, falling pavement, and suspension lines. Suddenly, a large chunk of the bridge falls in front of them, trapping them, but the man finds a metal beam attaching the two sides of the bridge and guides his ex-girlfriend across into safety. Before walking over the beam, Sam helps another one of his co-workers, Olivia, across, but the pavement abruptly shifts and Olivia slides off of the beam into the water. A car then falls from the bridge above her, crushing her. Another co-worker, Nathan, runs towards Sam to safety, but is impaled by a swinging suspension wire. Shortly after, Sam's boss, Dennis, runs in the same direction, but falls on the pavement cracks and clings to the side of the bridge. A a giant vat of tar tips over as the bridge shifts and falls directly on the boss, killing him instantly. Death is making this bridge its hunting ground, and as people run towards safety, Sam realizes his life is in extreme danger. Sam and Peter are the last two left, and they have no other choice but to jump from the bridge to safety. They land on a railing barely hanging onto the other side of the bridge and cling to it, but it won't be enough to save them. Metal poles from a construction truck slide from the bed and pierce the best friend through his face. Moments later, a sheet of metal falls, slicing Sam's body in half, but just before he dies, Sam finds himself back on the bus as if nothing ever happened, killing everyone but Molly and ending Sam's premonition. Okay, this is absolutely terrifying. People are falling to their deaths all around Sam. The bridge is collapsing, and swinging suspension wires are killing people left, right, and center. But there's something Sam here can do to have a greater chance at surviving. No matter what Sam does, the bridge is falling all around him, and he is in the middle of it. It's better that he controls when and where he's going to land by jumping into the water, rather than falling amongst rubble that could crush him at any moment. Now, normally jumping from the bridge's height would not be recommended. A jump from 100 meters or more makes the water tension equal to concrete, and dying on impact is very, very likely. However, Olivia here has just fallen and didn't die. Her fatal mistake was falling too close to the bridge. Therefore, we have to accept that the rules of this world operate differently than our own and use this to our advantage. If it were me, I would first wait to see if anyone else jumps and makes it. If others are able to make it without being killed, I would try to use different diving strategies to increase the likelihood I'll walk away from this alive. I would grab a piece of wreckage like a car door or tire to pad my fall. Doing this is called wreckage right and is a tactic that has been used by plane crash survivors falling from even greater heights. Using the piece of wreckage helps disrupt the amount of impact my body will take by allowing the tire or wreckage to absorb the fall. Parachuters whose shoots have failed have also successfully reduced the impact of their body by minimizing the surface area that will hit the water. This means if we keep our arms and legs as tight to our bodies as possible, we can suffer less damage. Now, Candace's death here draws attention to the fact that there's a boat in the water manned by someone in order for it to be moving at all. The boat that Candace falls on is moving beneath the bridge when she dies. Moments later, when the bus falls from the bridge and kills Isaac, the boat has already crossed over beneath it. At this point, the railing to the left of Sam, Molly, and Peter has yet to fall, leaving them enough time and room to jump safely on that side. If it were me, I would jump from this railing and once I'm in the water, I would swim away from the bridge and towards the boat to decrease my chances of being killed by rubble. It also doesn't make any sense that Sam and his co-workers walk across the bridge one at a time. The beam is already holding an entire bridge, and even though the bridge is crumbling, technically the beam is already holding everyone's weight. It's steel, and several humans aren't going to suddenly snap it. If it collapses, it's because the entire bridge is going to collapse. Sam could have saved their lives if they thought this through, but now they've cheated death and are going to regret it. Confused, Sam looks around the bus and tries to make sense of the situation, but the same events start to unfold. Realizing that they're all going to die, Sam stands up, grabs Molly's hand, and tells everyone that they have to get off the bus immediately. His ex-girlfriend follows him, but the others hesitate. They think he's totally lost his mind, and his friends only leave to see if they can convince him to come back. But just then, the bridge begins to collapse and crumble, as Sam had predicted, and everyone one is shocked. Sam and his friends escape in the nick of time, but the rest of their co-workers fall to their tragic death. 
that night, Sam is questioned by the FBI. He's asked how he knew about the bridge collapsing before it happened, and the agent insinuates that he must have had something to do with it in order for him to know what was going to happen beforehand. After being presented with overwhelming evidence that the collapse was a freak accident, Sam is released and free to go. Later, Sam and his remaining colleagues attend a memorial service for their deceased co-workers. They're still shocked that Sam knew the bridge was going to collapse and ask him how he knew, but he's still unable to give them a satisfying answer. As they leave, Sam and Peter are warned by a creepy coroner that death doesn't like to be cheated. The two men are confused and try to figure out what he's talking about, but he doesn't give them any more information. They let him go, but Sam and Peter are soon going to find out exactly what he meant. Okay, this is not good. Sam already cheated death once. He was able to see his own death exactly as it happened, and now he has an extremely creepy man saying cryptic things to him about dying at the funeral of his dead co-workers. Instead of tossing this up to a weird interaction with a creepo trying to scare me, I wouldn't let the coroner go, and would have to interrogate him to see what else I can find out. It's already pretty obvious that something supernatural is happening, but because that sounds ridiculous, it makes sense that the man and his best friend want to pretend the whole thing was a terrible coincidence. If it were me, I would interrogate the coroner further, and would learn that not only has this happened before, but it's happened multiple times. Near-death experiences are not uncommon occurrences in real life. The National Library of Medicine reports that 17% of those who nearly die experience what is referred to as an NDE. These NDEs can range from witnessing one's own death to having full-blown out-of-body experiences. Parapsychologists and quantum physicists such as Brian Josephson, a physicist that was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1973, have been hard at work trying to explain these events. Studies in quantum biology have shown that what is referred to as entanglement between photons is also present in living systems such as bacteria and potentially the human brain, which could explain what is called Christ telepathy, aka premonitions. What's important here is that both scientists and everyday people have reported that this can happen, which means that what happened to Sam was a real psychic event and not just a coincidence. Therefore, there is a chance he can trigger a premonition again. Since having a premonition is what saved him the last time, being able to see how and when he's going to die before death strikes will be essential to his survival. Psychics and their voints are of the belief that only certain people have the ability to tap into the supernatural, and if they have done it once, they can do it again. Since Sam is one of those people, he should use this to his advantage. If it were me, I would go to a well-regarded psychic and first test them to see if they are real. If they say I'm going to die, then I will know they are legitimate and will pay them to teach me how to connect with my psychic abilities and bring on these premonitions. To be extra cautious, I would adopt a cat and take it everywhere with me, because based on ancient Egyptian beliefs, cats have a special relationship with death and can anticipate when someone is going to die. Even though this sounds ridiculous and would probably ruin my social life, when death is on the line, it's better to be superstitious than sorry. Sam returns to his normal life, but instead of working at the paper company, decides to pursue his passion of becoming a chef. He's offered a residency in Paris, but decides he doesn't want to leave before he figures out whether he can still make things work with his ex-girlfriend. He goes to her house to ask why she broke up with him, and he realizes that she still has feelings for him after she reveals that she broke up with him because she doesn't want to ruin his chances at Paris. Meanwhile, Peter goes to Candace's last gymnastics practice before a competition. She's agitated and complains that she's nervous, but Peter reassures her that everything is going to be fine. To make matters worse, the AC in the gym isn't working, and a fan with a faulty wire is brought in to replace it. Overhead fans have also been turned all the way up to keep the gymnast cool. The gymnast performs a superstitious luck ritual by twirling rubber bands around her wrist before going on the mat. She accidentally snaps one of them and freaks out. She pauses and feels the same eerie feeling Sam felt before the bus drove over the bridge. Candace chooses to ignore it and begins her performance, but little does she know this is a decision that will get her killed. A screw from one of the overhead fans comes loose and falls onto the beam. Unknowingly, the gymnast dances around it, barely missing it, and dismounts the beam without error. She lands dangerously close to the faulty fan wire that now sits in a pool of water that dripped down from the overhead fan. Luckily, she walks away scot-free, but death is about to make its final move. Candace mounts the high bar where a screw loosens on the left-hand side. The combination of traps she's already evaded forces another gymnast to trip and fall, sending chalk into Candace's face as she releases her hands from the high bar. She flies through the air, unable to see how and where she's going to land, and this time, rather than dismounting gracefully, Candace lands upside down, breaking her neck, back, and pretty much everything else. That's one death down, with nine more to go. Later at the gym, Sam arrives to console Peter, who tries to make sense of Candace's death. Over Peter's shoulder, Sam thinks he spot the coroner again from the memorial service, but he disappears before Sam can confront him. 
Okay, now athletes get the jitters from time to time, but Candace has just survived a supernatural experience where Sam also had a bad feeling before acting on it in order to survive. Doing the same here and leaving would have been the smart move. This is a hard situation to be in because Candace has nothing to base her fear off of other than a feeling and a broken rubber band. However, what superstition other than intuition with an unknown cause and effect? Having just survived a near-death experience, Candace is ignoring her intuition at her own peril. If it were me, I would track down a new set of rubber bands and see if the same thing happens again. This might sound silly, but at the end of the day, pregame rituals are a major part of professional athletes' routines when getting ready to perform. According to a study published in the International Review of Sport and Exercise Psychology, pregame rituals are not just about superstitions, but can boost an athlete's overall performance. These rituals help reduce anxiety and make the athlete feel they are in more control of the situation. It also allows a couple more seconds for the athlete to narrow their focus and prepare for the task regardless of how simple or complex the ritual is. Twirling her rubber bands effectively may have helped Candace get in the right headspace before performing her routine. Death may have been out to get her, but at the end of the day, it was human error that made her release the high beam too soon. Chalk had just been blown into her face, and if she had held on for a couple moments longer, she would have been able to dismount without anything obscuring her vision. In the case of the band had snapped again, that should have been a surefire way to hang up her unitard and call it a day. Sam and Peter are also ignoring their intuition here. Not only have they survived a freak accident, but now another horrible freak accident has claimed the life of Peter's girlfriend. The term freak accident has been used to describe both events in a very short period of time. The whole point of definition of freak accidents is that they are highly unlikely and occur under unlikely circumstances. This is another situation where they should lean into their intuition and try to chase down the coroner to get more answers about the connection between these two instances. But instead, like Candace, they ignore these signs and choose to chalk it up to the unexplainable. Sam heads to the Presage paper office to clear out his things, along with Molly, Peter, and Olivia. On the other side of the office, Isaac shifts through to see his co-worker's drawers. He pricks his finger on a thumbtack while looking through a drawer. And and finds a gift card to a massage parlor. He pockets the gift card and heads out of the office. The group cracks open a few beers and a bottle of whiskey when Olivia gets a text from a friend telling her that they have arrived to take her to an eye doctor's appointment. As she's about to leave, her back hits a picture frame off of her desk and onto the floor. She picks it up and notices that the glass is broken on her face. It's a creepy coincidence, but it's not enough to stop Olivia from going to her appointment. Isaac arrives at the massage parlor and proceeds to hit on the front desk attendant, who sends him back to her room and assigns him an older Chinese masseuse that pretends not to speak English. The masseuse puts acupuncture needles all over him and leaves him to sleep for 30 minutes, but that's when Death decides to make its next move. While Isaac lays on the massage bed, a fire breaks out in his room and a bottle of antiseptic alcohol falls on the floor. Worried, Isaac tries to call out for help, but the wheel of his bed breaks and he falls off the massage table. The acupuncture needles pierce his skin and he's left alone to lay in the alcohol, unconscious as the fire grows. Panicked, he comes to and tries to pull a needle from his skin. Just as Isaac reaches the door to leave, his phone vibrates on the other side of the room. He pauses to look at it, and this gives Death enough time to tip a candle next to the phone onto the floor, igniting the alcohol. Isaac is thrown back by the flames, and even though the fire doesn't quite reach him, the impact of hitting the wall dislodges a shelf above him, and a Buddha statue tumbles down, crushing his skull. That's two deaths down, with eight more to go. Back at the office, Peter learns about Isaac's death and tells Sam and Molly. The co-workers go to the scene of the accident, and there they see the creepy coroner. Horrified by Isaac's brutal death at the massage parlor, the co-workers finally start to catch on that there's something abnormal about all of these deaths. Sam finally approaches the coroner, and he explains that by not dying on the bridge, they broke death's rules and created a wrinkle in reality. That means that death is going to hunt them down and kill them one by one until the score is finally settled. That is, unless they decide to kill someone in their place. Okay, so not one, but two of Sam's co-workers have died in crazy freak accidents, and now he knows for a fact that Death is out to get him. Not only that, but there's a set of rules that Death is playing by that he hasn't been filled in on yet. The good news is as long as he can figure out what these rules are, two can play at any game. First, I would look at the events that have transpired so far to help me better understand what Death's tells are and how we can anticipate its next move. Based on what the coroner has told me, Death is an entity that can comprehend when reality is unbalanced. Death can also make mistakes. The fact that we're alive proves that it can be beaten. I would then collect the autopsy and coroner's report, both of which are available to the public under the Open Records Act. Presage paper is also located in New York State, which means that we can get access to non-confidential police reports by filling a FOIL request. Once I review these files, I'll realize that there's a pattern in the ways these deaths have been carried out. The coroner's report would reveal that Isaac was pierced by acupuncture needles, and the room around him was on fire, but neither of those things killed him. Candace's death was brought on by a deadly dismount from the high bar, but only moments before she was able to dance around the same screw her teammates stepped on. The police report would reveal that a 
faulty wire was exposed to a puddle of water right in the middle of the mat. Both times, death laid multiple traps for its victims before they were actually killed. From this information, we can conclude that death has a plan A, B, C, and maybe even a Z to kill us. But we have a short window of time in between, when death shows up and when we are killed. Studying death's tells will help us utilize the short window of time to escape death. The problem that Candace and Isaac both had is that they didn't know death was out to get them or what signs to look for. Sam's premonition allowed him to realize that death was right around the corner after he accidentally pricked his finger on a shard of metal and heard the radio malfunction. Seeing the signs and patterns of death can help us know what it can use against us and develop a sixth sense for it. Parents are exceptionally good at this when it comes to protecting their children. They're able to see danger around every corner in a room, every wire on the ground, and every dangerous object before a child interacts with it. This is due to the fact that after a mother gives birth, activity in the amygdala portion of the brain grows in the weeks and months after she gives birth. An enhanced amygdala makes the mother hypersensitive to these dangers. This hypersensitivity can also be developed over time in men from day-to-day -day caregiving. If we spend time day in and day out training ourselves to pick up on these dangers, as more and more of our co-workers become death's victims, we can train our amygdala to be hypersensitive to the specific signs. This is also commonly referred to as fear conditioning. Sam tells the group that based on what the coroner has just told them, Molly is safe from death because he was able to save her from dying on the bridge. Peter grows angry at this because he can't understand why Sam would choose to save Molly above everyone else. Across town, Olivia gets surgery on her eyes to correct her eyesight. Frightened, the doctor gives Olivia a teddy bear to hold as he straps her into the laser eye machine. Unfortunately for Olivia, this teddy bear isn't going to provide any comfort at all. Nervous, Olivia rips the teddy bear's eyes from its socket when the doctor realizes that his assistant has given him an incomplete file. He leaves Olivia in the room alone with only the one-eyed teddy bear to keep her company. Outside in the hallway, a water cooler bubbles, tipping over a glass of water Olivia placed on it before entering the operating room. The cup of water splashes onto an electrical outlet with a plug that leads into the room and to the laser eye machine. The machine malfunctions and Olivia calls out for help, but nobody can hear her panicked cries. Olivia reaches for the emergency stop button, but instead tips over the machine's remote and turns the laser on. A beam shoots out of the machine and lasers Olivia straight in the eye. She struggles to remove her head from the device and tries to shield herself from the laser, but instead it carves into her palm. Worried, Sam and Molly arrive at the optometrist's office and hear Olivia screaming. They barge into the operating room and arrive just in time to see Olivia finally break free from the machine and trip on the discarded teddy bear on. She loses her balance and falls out the glass window onto a car and to her death. That's three deaths down with seven more to go. Later, the FBI agent that has been following Sam shows up and after collecting information from the doctor's office, reveals that it would have taken at least five different systems to have failed in order for the machine to malfunction. Okay, interestingly, Olivia's death played out as elaborately as both Candace and Isaac's did, further validating the theory that there is time to escape death after we see it is out to get us. Like Candace and Isaac, Olivia chose to ignore a minor inconvenience paired with an eerie feeling and paid the cost with her life. For Olivia, her minor inconvenience came in the form of the broken picture, but since she hasn't done any research, she wasn't able to read the sign when it was presented to her. However, based on the optometrist's observations, it would have been difficult even for the doctor to have anticipated something was going to go wrong. If I were Sam and Molly, and I were trying to warn Olivia that death is on its way to kill her, I would first call the doctor's office in order to stop the procedure from happening. Sam and Molly clearly know where Olivia is since they head there from the massage parlor. I would look up the office's number on the internet or in a phone book and warn Olivia ahead of time. Olivia is already scared to do the procedure, so it shouldn't take long to convince her to not go through with it. I would tell the front desk that it was an emergency, and once I have Olivia on the phone, I would tell her my mom had the same procedure and died from it. She might think it's a prank if I tell her that death is coming to settle a supernatural score. So instead, I would convince her that I'm genuinely concerned about the surgery. Sam and Molly waste their time going to the hospital in person. If I were Olivia and a doctor left me alone with my head strapped to a faulty machine and I wasn't able to get loose, I would look for ways to break the machine. Sure, I might have to pay for it later, but it's better than having lost an eye or even worse, dying. I would first reach down and take off my shoe and use the heel to stab the glass laser until it's completely destroyed. I would also punch and kick at the body of the machine wherever my arms and legs could reach it in order to push the laser beam away. I would then take my other shoe and I would throw it against the operating room door or out the glass window to draw attention to myself earlier. Olivia completely panics and the machine destroys her instead of her destroying it. At this point, we also know that Molly is getting out of the situation scot-free since she didn't die in the premonition. Since we now know that we have the option to kill someone in our place and Peter is acting irate, it's hard to know what lengths he might be willing to go in order to live. Since Sam is a man on borrowed time, he's safe from his co-workers and can stay in their presence to 
matter how unhinged they get. However, I would get Molly on the next plane out of the country on a little vacation, so none of them get any crazy ideas about killing her and stealing her life. Nothing says relaxing quite like escaping death for a second time. The FBI agent asks the co-workers if they know what's causing the deaths, and they explain to the agent that they think death is out to get them after surviving the collapsing bridge. Not knowing what to believe, but having no better explanation, the FBI agent leaves them alone. Having reconciled, Sam and Molly go home together. Sam then stays up all night trying to find clues to how these deaths are working, and finally puts the pieces together that everyone is dying in the order they died in his premonition. But this knowledge has come too late. Death has already set plans into motion to find Nathan, as Sam realizes he's next on the list. At the factory, Nathan reviews Roy's timesheet, where he has written f*** you in big bold letters. Annoyed, Nathan calls Roy to meet at the control room, but before Roy gets there, Nathan looks down at how high up they are from the ground. He pauses and notices that a crane near them has faulty wiring that's about to snap. Instead of moving, Roy arrives outside of the control room, and he and Nathan argue, and as the argument grows more heated, the crane begins to move closer to them until it's over their heads. Nathan notices that at any moment, if they don't move, it will come crashing down on them. He tries to warn him, but Roy doesn't listen. Nathan shoves him beneath the hook, sending the man flying down towards the factory floor, and only to be stopped by the hook spearing him straight through the head. Roy dies in Nathan's place, and that's four deaths down, with six more to go. Peter, who has grown increasingly unhinged, tries to warn his boss about Death's vendetta, but this plan backfires. Instead of believing him, Dennis calls the FBI to report on this suspicious activity, and follows Peter down to the factory floor, where Sam and Molly have arrived to warn Nathan about Death's list. Peter is hell-bent on figuring out whether or not Nathan killed Roy on purpose, and interrogates him. Eventually, Nathan admits that deep down, he must have done it on purpose, and the co-workers wonder if this means that Nathan will live, like the coroner told them. Just then, a wrench tips close to a spinning mechanism, and sends the wrench flying straight right into Dennis's head, killing him on impact, and confirming the coroner's theory that if one of the survivors kills another person, they will take their place on death's list, and death will skip over the survivor. That's five deaths down, with five more to go. Sam chooses to return to work and take his chances, rather than kill someone, but by doing nothing, there are options he's overlooking. Okay, Nathan killing Roy and death skipping him is a game changer. Not only does this mean that Nathan doesn't have to die, but we now know for a fact that there are actually ways death's rules can be bent or broken. However, trying to kill someone is messy. Not only because Sam could get caught and spend the years he's now gained in jail, but the question of who to kill is a heavy one that is riddled with nuances that could affect his lifespan regardless of if he actually goes through with it. For example, if Sam kills someone on death row, does he get all of that person's years because the person is being killed by other humans before their time? Or is this a part of the individual's fate? The same can be said for going to war. If Sam killed a bunch of people in combat, were these people always destined to die? And if so, that doesn't help him, and only increases his lifespan for a little bit longer. The details around how the killing someone theory works is not clear, and if you think about it logically, the safest bet in this scenario would be killing someone very young, so you acquire as many years as possible. That would mean Sam would have to go the rest of his life a murderer, knowing he killed someone innocent, which is not good either. Rather than go down the rabbit hole of deciding who to kill, I would try to trap Peter in a death-proof environment like a mental institution to keep death from getting him. Since we all survived death, we evaded the natural order of things, and therefore, death can only get us in an unnatural way. If we isolate Peter in a chamber like a bubble boy, where he will be protected from physical harm for the rest of his life, then no one else will be in danger of dying. Saving someone by trapping Peter also calls into question two other theories worth exploring. Since my existence is considered a wrinkle in reality, if I save a bunch of people, death will also have to try to kill them too, in order to bring about the natural order of things. The same thing is true for if I have children. If I have a ton of kids, they are technically innocent from death's game, since they don't have a predestined death, but they also aren't supposed to be alive either. Therefore, if I become a doctor and save a bunch of people, or donate to a sperm bank, this will increase the amount of work that death has to do in order to erase my existence from reality. I could take this tactic a step further, and also become an organ donor. By distributing my non-essential organs to different people, I'll have saved more people, and also distributed parts of myself to other people's bodies. If these people were always supposed to receive transplants, my organ being in their body complicates the fabric of reality even more, since I was not supposed to be alive to give it to them. This keeps the person from getting the organ they were supposed to receive. But if they were never supposed to die in the first place, this creates another conundrum for death that can only be concluded with their natural death. By doing this, I can hopefully throw off death's plans even more until he's so exhausted, he'll wait until the next century to try to set things right. Before going to work, Sam tells Molly to meet him at the restaurant after closing time. All around Sam, he sees opportunities for death to kill him, but luckily, it's not his time. He makes it through a shift unscathed and tells the head chef he will 
take him up on his offer for the Paris residency. He brings Molly dessert and tells her the good news, but they are disrupted by Peter, who stands outside the restaurant window. Sam welcomes him in, but he's soon going to realize this was a huge mistake. Peter looks like he's seen better days. He tells him that he's been up all night thinking over whether he can kill someone. He had plenty of opportunities, but came to the conclusion that he had to kill someone that deserved to die. Peter pulls a gun on Molly, having decided that it doesn't make sense she's the only one that gets to live from the bridge. Sam throws a table in front of Peter as he fires the gun, and both Sam and Molly run to the kitchen to hide. He tries to distract him, but Peter isn't interested in Sam, since he is also a man on borrowed time. The best friend shoots a gas tank, releasing flammable gas into the air, and knocks the man unconscious. He starts to turn on the stoves to blow up the building, and Molly tries to arm herself with a knife, but as she turns to look for Peter, the FBI agent suddenly turns the corner. He's been following them ever since the accident, and entered the restaurant when he heard the gunshot. Molly warns him that Peter has a gun, but it's too late. The man fires, killing the agent and taking his life. With the agent standing in for Peter, that's six deaths down and four more to go. Having just committed murder, Death moves on from Peter to Sam, but Peter isn't done with Molly just yet. Even though he has the agent's years, he doesn't want to risk being turned in and tries to kill Molly again, making it clear they still got beef to settle. Death could kill Sam at any moment now, but instead of laying low and trying to avoid sharp kitchen objects, Sam jumps on Peter. He strikes Peter with a pan, setting the gun flying onto a lit stove. The two men fight, throwing kitchen objects at one another, and after Peter shoves Sam's head into a vat of grease, he gets the upper hand. Molly jumps on Peter, but he quickly throws her off of him. He picks up a kitchen kitchen knife and prepares to kill her once and for all, but unbeknownst to Peter, Sam has picked up a spear and stabs it through Peter's chest. That's seven deaths down, with three more to go. Okay, Peter is on the warpath, and it seems like nothing is going to stop him from killing Molly. Sam does a good job of fighting Peter off, but there's something he could do when Peter first pulls out the gun to try to end the fight quicker. Sam knows from earlier in his shift that death isn't coming for him. There were multiple opportunities for it to kill him, but it didn't. Since Sam knows this, rather than hiding Molly in the kitchen, I would go on the offensive and attack Peter from the get-go. Even though Peter has a gun, it's essentially useless against me, since death isn't trying to kill me right now, and I might as well take advantage of this opportunity to play the part of Superman while I still can. Death is also after Peter, so there's a higher likelihood that I'll be able to kill him when I fight back against him. Although Sam doesn't want to kill anyone, Peter has shown up with a gun and wants to kill his girlfriend, so the time to act is now. Rather than draw Peter back to the kitchen where there are plenty of opportunities to find new weapons, I would push Peter through the glass window behind him. If this doesn't kill him, then it will at least draw attention to us, and others will notice there's a man with a gun trying to kill me. Jim Block, the FBI agent, is outside watching us and can help me, but even if he wasn't, this would be the right move. By bringing the fight outside, it increases the chances of someone calling the police or Peter getting scared off by the potential of jail. Once the gun is taken away from Peter, there isn't anything else on sight for him to defend himself with either. Peter dies from his stab wounds and the lights flicker above Sam and Molly. The gun on the stove goes off and the bullet barely misses Sam. They conclude this means Sam took the life Peter stole from the FBI agent and he has now gained those years. Two weeks later, thinking they are safe, Sam and Molly board a flight to Paris. An unruly passenger is removed from the plane, but it takes off without any issue. Sam puts on his music and realizes it's the same song that played when the bridge collapsed. Panicked, Sam removes his headphones and notices the fastened seatbelt lights blinking. He realizes that nothing has actually changed and death is still after him. His thumb cuts on a piece of metal and he overhears the flight attendant say the unruly passenger left because he had a panic attack and thought it was a vision. Just then, Sam looks out the window and watches as the jet engine explodes, tearing holes in the plane and ripping Molly out into the air into a brutal death. Sam then dies a gruesome and horrifying death as the plane catches on fire and he is burnt alive, making that nine deaths down with one more to go. Not one to be beaten, Death sends the wheel of Sam's plane into the roof of Roy's memorial service, killing Nathan and sending the last of the Presage Paper co-workers on one final retreat. That's all ten deaths down with no survivors. But what do you think? How would you beat the final destination? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.